Howdy folks, I'm Hank Sheffer, and here we are once again with Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. Uh, today, once again, I'm here with Larry Hedrick, and I'm here to tell you among his many other achievements, he and longtime friend Tom Collinborn were the original founders of the Superstition Mountain Museum. I would think that just getting the doors open for that at that time had to be a horrendous job, just trying to figure out what to do with all the history, the donations, and especially the hundreds of the unidentified artifacts that you had. That had to be a monster. But you know, we got our tax exempt status in 1980, and we were nine years collecting things before we mm. got a museum. And it was a rented facility in a shell building. And uh, I was the only person, there weren't very many people on the board, but I was the only person in, in a position to quit my job and, and, and do the project. And I did, I quit my job with Maricopa County Sheriff's Office and took a huge cut in pay and <laughs> uh, grasping every bit of volunteer help I could get my hands on. We had to do the electrical, the insulation, the sheetrock and, and everything on that shell building. And it also, I didn't think it would go this far, but also, uh, you know, I had to build the exhibits and then it fell upon me to display the stuff and identify it for the public. <laughs> and uh, that was a horrendous job. Uh, the only thing I had to go on at that time was the, uh, the official appraisers had identified the name of some of these things and there were pictures of each item. We had uh, over 400 pieces of uh, Indian artifacts from all over Arizona and parts of New Mexico. And then we had a pretty good collection of ho ho com pottery and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, the ho ho com pottery is so different than all the other pottery, it's easy to identify. But there are so many phases of it over from the AD 300 to 1400 oh my goodness. that uh, there's some subtle changes in the kind of designs on the pots, and you have to get that right. And we never had enough money to hire a a professional to do that when you when you're a fledgling organization so had to be a lot of research going in oh you. my goodness well today we're going to approach talking about Indian artifacts we're gonna we're going to uh, talk about cowboys and Indians uh, from the historical point of view not from the Hollywood uh, sensationalized cowboys and Indians and cavalry and that kind of stuff Specifically, we're going to explore the Apache Wars. That's where we want to go with this, okay? Um, so before we could do any of that, though, we really have to know who was here in Arizona uh, before the Apaches even arrived. Uh, there's always been a lot of confusion about who was actually here and who wasn't. And somebody says Indian, they always say Apache. And that's, that's just not right, is it? Yeah, well, the Apaches were not indigenous to Arizona. The, the original people in Arizona were, were uh, strictly from Arizona. They weren't scattered all over the place. That was the Hohokam Indians. That's where the Native Americans that were actually here first, although there were a couple of other tribes. And uh, on our map here, the, the chief location of the Hohokam, the main body of them, was located on the Salt River and the Gila River between Phoenix and Casa Grande. They were uh, some amazing people. I mean, I don't know how their government was formed. I never saw an archeologist tell me what kind of a government they, mm -hmm. that they had, but these people were close knit and they cooperated with each other. They had to because they developed one of the greatest canal systems and irrigation systems on the planet. And there was miles and miles and miles of this stuff. And, and in fact, on one piece of literature I was reading, it called it, um, this was the Valley of the Stone Ho. Because we have a picture, a unique piece of the slate that itself. made out of stone and they used their hands. They just used their hands to dig these canals. And you know, you didn't do it with two or three people. You had to have thousands of people cooperating to get this done. And um, 
then, of course, as the, as the decades went by, or I, I should say the centuries went by and their populations grew and they established themselves in that area, they began to expand somewhat from the, the core mm -hmm. location. And most of that was to the east because they went up the Salado River and up the Gila River, took them towards Superstition Mountain. And they actually had a, a pretty good village right at the west end of Superstition Mountain. Uh, I'm calling them flatlanders. There wasn't any, there wasn't any mountains involved with with Garden Valley, but um, it was a nice. It was a valley that was pretty flat with a little bit of a slope to it, where the water run down, and they had their irrigation system set up in there. Just mm -hmm. you know, and they could grow just about anything they wanted. And uh, as you went just a little bit further east, you, then you run into the Salado Indians, and they got along fine with these people. Uh, the Salado was uh, located up at uh, Roosevelt Lake and in between the Superstition Mountains in the canyons to Roosevelt Lake and they were cliff dwellers and there's all kinds of cliff dwellings and stuff. In fact, I think there was 140 documented uh, Indian ruins in the Superstitions that were major ruins and there had to be twice that many that, that weren't major ruins. Well, that was, you're saying that was a long time ago. So when did the modern era of tribes actually, as we know them, start to come into being? Oh, there again, now the archeologists were saying that the Hohokam and, and the, uh, the associated tribes were uh, driven out uh, or disappeared in 1450. Yet they also tell us that the Pima and the Papago are the direct descendants of the Hohokam. Okay. And the Papago and the Pimas claim that they are the direct descendants. It, it's, it's not just the archeologists saying that, they claim that. And so, and as I mentioned, some of the archeologists are beginning to change their theory someplace. When I came out here in the 60s, the only thing you can, you could, or the 50s and 60s, the only thing you understood was drought and disease was what killed them all off. Yet 50 years later, no, 80 years later in 1534, now remember they disappeared mm -hmm. in 1450, 1450, but in 1535, the Pimas were fighting with the Spaniards that mm -hmm. come in here. Uh, at first, uh, they were friendly with the Spaniards or conquistadors, I guess you'd call them. Uh, but they were abused by the, they, they were put in the mines and made to work for the Spaniards and they got fed up with that and they revolted and they drove the Spaniards out of their area. Hmm. So 80 years after the Hohokam then disappeared, the direct descendants of the Hohokam are still here. The Hohokam didn't go anywhere. Let me give you a prime example of that. In 1963, 19, not 1863, 1963, 57 years ago, mm -hmm. the Papagos decided to change their name. They now call themselves the Tejano Odom. Well, what do you think? 500 years from now, is some archeologist gonna put out a paper <laughs> and say, hey, you know, in the 16, in 1900s, the Papago just up and disappeared and they we don't know where they went. It might have, must have been a drought. You know. <laughs> They didn't go anywhere. They just became somebody Something else. else. And, and, and I'm convinced, yes, drought had an effect on their numbers. Disease had an effect on their numbers. The Apache attacks had an effect on their numbers. But they didn't go anywhere. They just changed their name. They didn't become extinct. <laughs> they they didn't become something else. So were the Pima, Papago, and Maricopa actually warlike tribes? It sounds like a whole lot of fight going on with everybody fighting everybody for Pete's sake. Yeah, uh, you know, you opened this up by saying cowboys versus Indians. <laughs> and all I've seen so far is Indians versus Indians. And there was a lot more of it because after the Pima and the Papago revolted against the Spaniards and drove them out of the area, 25 years later, they banded together with the Spanish to fight the Apaches. Right. <laughs> because the Apaches went down into old Mexico, and in northern Mexico, there was hardly a village or a hamlet that hadn't been hit, and they'd done it all the way up to the Gila River, wiping out several uh, Pima villages. Uh, the Pima word for Maricopa is the people towards the river. 
Well, the, the Maricopa are all west of the Pima, so the, the river they're talking about is the Colorado River. Would have to be. And, and the Mojave and the Yuma Indians drove the Maricopas out of the uh, Colorado River, and the only choice they had was to come up the Gila River towards the Pimas. And the Yumas, the, the Mojaves quit fooling with them once they drove them off the river, but the Yumas kept coming after them. And every time they tried to establish themselves, they had to establish themselves along the river. I mean, water was the most crucial thing well, sure. out here. And, and the only way you could survive was to follow the river. In fact, uh, you know, even in modern times here in the 60s in Arizona, we have seen, before they raised Roosevelt Dam, 77 feet, we have seen uh, droughts here that all the water levels in all the lakes, uh, Canyon Lake, Apache Lake, Saguaro mm -hmm. Lake, Roosevelt Lake, was so low that the cities like Mesa ordered that you don't wash your cars, you don't water your grass, and the restaurants wouldn't even give you a glass of water unless you asked for it. So that's how crucial water was. In fact, in 1934, there was such a situation that the California had built aqueducts from the Colorado River all the way to Los Angeles. And the governor of Arizona sent the National Guard over there and declared war on California. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they commandeered a paddle wheel boat and crossed the river and stopped California from stealing the Colorado water. Because all the, all the water that supplies the Colorado River comes from Arizona and Utah. Mm -hmm. None of it comes from California, so California was stealing our water. And that, of course, <laughs> led to the Central Arizona Project, where a canal now runs from the Colorado River through Phoenix all the way to Tucson, so we can use our share of that water. And Finally, the Yumas drove the Maricopas so close to the Pimas that the Pimas joined forces with the Maricopa and s defeated the Yumas. And they never come back up the river again. And the, the Maricopas and Pimas, they lived peacefully from then on. So yeah, they were warlike, but only in self-defense. I saw nowhere where they were out attacking anybody unless it was... It had to be something defending themselves from the Spaniards, from the Yumas, from the Apaches, whatever. So it sounds like Hollywood's going to have to change all those films over again because it's Indians and Indians <laughs> and there ain't no cowboys around. There ain't no cowboys. So we see the terrible circumstances that are taking place in those early days. When did the Pima actually encounter the American people? And in 1847, still during the Mexican War, the Mormon battalion was a military unit in uniform with weapons and wagons and stuff like that. They left Council Bluffs, Iowa and, uh, and came to Santa Fe and they had 500 men involved in that, 34 women and some children. But as they left Santa Fe, things got, uh, some, some of them got pretty sick and it got pretty tough and most of the women, in fact, all of them but one, because only one woman and one child made it to San Diego. Oh my goodness. And they, not that they died, they just had to go back, not all the way to Council Bus, but they just had to drop out, and 200 men dropped out. And uh, by the time they got, they went down to Rio Grande, all the way down to, to almost Mesilla, someplace in that area, not far from the Texas border, and headed west to Tucson. By the time they got to Tucson, they were in dire shape. Um, when they left Tucson, there was a bunch of stragglers. Uh, the wagons, uh, some of the wagons were breaking down and the animals were breaking down and it was a tough go. I think they went 26 hours without any water whatsoever. And when they got to the Pima villages, the Pimas, were the most helpful people in the world. In fact, they, they took water back down to the stragglers and brought them in. And uh, the, the lead elements were so tired and everything, they, a lot of them just went to sleep and left their wagons sitting there with all kinds of stuff in the wagon and guns and what have you. And the, the, the Pima's not one item was ever stolen out of any of that stuff. In fact, when they went on to, to San Diego, 
they left some mules there for to replace some of the mules on the straggler wagons when they come in with nobody there to guard them. And when they got there, they turned the mules over. And the, these people, they weren't thieves and they weren't liars. They, they, that's, that's why we can say they were peaceful people. They only fought in self-defense. And I gotta, I gotta hand it to them, you know. Uh, they saved, you know, our, our producer here, Dave Jones, had three relatives in the Mormon battalion and they saved one of his family's life. Well, I'm glad that happened. Well, it sounds like things had really turned around here so that the Indians weren't fighting. Uh, none of that was going on anymore. And yet we had the U.S. Army coming down to, what were they coming here for anyway if there was nothing to fight over? The United States Army didn't come in here in 1862 to fight Apaches. They didn't? No. They came in to get rid of the Confederates that were in oh. Tucson, remember? <laughs> I forgot all about that. Yeah, them. yeah. <laughs> and the Apaches, you know, the Apaches never let up on anybody. When the Civil War started, uh, many forts were abandoned and all the Union soldiers were pulled out of Arizona and New Mexico to be sent back east and the, the Apaches went nuts. They were attacking everybody. The only safe place was the Tucson Presidio. If you left Tucson, you were taking your life in your own hands. And the, the Pimas and Maricopas and Papagos were suffering under that too. So when, uh, by the way, uh, one of the uh, lieut uh, lieutenant in the Mormon battalion was none other than Colonel Carlton, who led the 2,300 men back into back Arizona in <laughs> to get rid of the Confederates. And uh, when they got to Apache Pass, following the Confederates, for some reason, after letting Kearney and the Mormon battalion go without attacking them, they jumped all over the lead elements of the California column. The California column had artillery pieces and, wiped and them. well, they didn't wipe them out, but uh, the, the Apaches had never seen artillery. And, and uh, the thing of it was the California columns got their first taste of Apache depredations. And um, that's, that was a wake up call. In the California column, the man that was in charge of all the wagons that was in the column mm -hmm. was Lieutenant Walker, John Walker. There was a lot of wagons because during the Battle of Picacho Pass, when uh, Captain Calloway came down to the pass and found the battle was over, he had 272 men and 10 wagons. So there were 2,000 men left in the California column. So how many wagons they must have had? Oh my had. goodness. Anyway, Walker was in charge of all the wagons, even though they were sending people over piecemeal because they were the animals were drinking up all the wells and the wells had to have time to recover. Uh, when he got to the Pima villages, uh, he was amazed um, of the wheat fields and, and other grain that was uh, involved with the Pimas and Maricopas. I mean, there was, they had food plenty. Uh, the Mormon battalion, when they left there, they were cutting, the, the Pimas loved their brass buttons and they were cutting the buttons off their uniforms and trading for loaves of bread for a single <laughs> button. I mean, you know, it, the, they, had, they had plenty. And um, Walker became in charge of uh, doing business with the Pimas and Maricopas to buy this grain to feed the animals of the army. When you were talking about all these attacks going on by the Apaches, I mean, it seemed like they were everywhere. Was this all just one tribe of people that were all under one chief or something, or were they all over the place? What was the deal with that? Well, I think I mentioned before that I don't know what kind of government the Hohokam had, or I don't know exactly what kind of government the people, Pimas had. The archaeologists don't really discuss that, but you know, you know how you have a, a organizational chart? Sure. And, and the Hohokam and the Pimas, in order to dig these canals and, and do what they did, you know, you had to have a, a level of people here, and then up above them are the chiefs. You and must then, have a chain and, of command. Yeah, you? there's a chain of command there in order to get uh, all these jobs done and these hundreds of miles of canals dug. There had to be some form of government that sure. allowed that communication to, to occur. But the Apaches, they didn't have a chain of command. They were here, 
here, here. They were they were independent of each other, and they could you could make peace with one tribe, or and every tribe had several bands. Mm -hmm. You can make peace with even a band, and the rest of them Would wouldn't agree. It they'd still <laughs> shoot you. <laughs> and uh, oh my goodness. And that you know then, and Walker. After he got back and was he was out of the army now, and and he he got the Pimas and the Maricopas together, and formed a militia to protect them from the Apaches. Uh, at first, it had nothing to do with the army, but in 1865, the militia Pima and Maricopas are the ones that went up and built the first adobe adobe buildings for Fort McDowell. I'll be doing. And and the army cooperated with them, and even issued them parts of uniforms. The jackets they had for the Pimas were trimmed in blue, and the jackets for the uh, Maricopas were trimmed in red. <laughs> so they were uh, identified from each other, uh, even though they may have fought together. But but their chiefs, uh, I think, with the chief of the P uh, Pimas was a guy named Azul. He was made a sergeant over all his men. Mm -hmm. and now see, now you had a communication. You didn't have a communication problem because the chief of the Pimas was, take care he of was in charge. And the same thing with the Maricopas. And they, um, they, they cooperated very well with the army because a Lieutenant um, Thomas Ewing, which I've been, that, that's my mother's maiden name. I didn't try to find out if that Ewing was related, but I can't find anything on him. Um, he came down to the Pima villages with a small group of s white soldiers, and he he f formed up with the Maricopas and the Pimas, and Walker, who called himself a captain now of the militia. I mean, he he worked with the Pimas, he lived with them, he dressed like them, and, and he fought with them, and and they went off. Uh, uh, what well, to do Apache Pass? You need to, our viewers need to go back and find Apache Pass and watch that because I can't go through the whole thing here. But but um, uh, when they got to uh, north of, tw they went 25 miles north of the Gila River and Lieutenant Ewing took the Maricopas and went to Tonto Basin mm -hmm. and Walker took the Pimas and went to Apache Pass. See? Mm -hmm. And th there was always this cooperation there. Uh, you see, between 1865 in 1871, the Pimas and the Maricopas were going out with the military as the leaders. Mm -hmm. They were the scouts, and they were going out two and three hundred at a time. And they were usually responding to some depredation that the Apaches did on somebody, and they would just go out and try to run them down. They wouldn't stay out for long periods of time. And between 1865 and 1871, you know, Mesa didn't exist at that time. S Superior didn't exist at that time. Phoenix was brand new. That was established in 68. And, and uh, one of the older cities in Arizona was Prescott in mm -hmm. Yavapai County. And during that seven year period there to 1871, there had been over 300 murders by the Apaches. And, and, uh, a couple of thousand horses, mules, and sheep, and pigs had been stolen and stuff mm -hmm. like that. The, and some of these depredations were pretty horrible stuff. And yet, on the other hand, it was rare, but on occasion, they stopped somebody, took their horses, took whatever they want, and left them alone. But mostly they, I'm sorry, they yeah. butchered them, you know. A lot of torture went on, and, 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 and that came to kind of an end in 1871 when Stoneman, mm -hmm. who was an engineer and was building roads <laughs> more than anything else, when the, the um, Fort Grant massacre took place in 1871, General Grant called that murder because that was 50 Mexicans and nearly 100 Papagos and only six white men they went out and slaughtered some Indians, and it was the wrong Indians. Oh my and God. President Grant called that murder, and he replaced Stoneman. Not that it was his fault, but 
you know, he was in command with General Crook, and General Crook changed everything. So after all these years in Hollywood giving us a full measure of Apaches being the scouts with the Army, that just wasn't so. That, I mean, that, that didn't happen at all, did it? No, they, the Apaches weren't used until 1871. And General Grant wanted to get the Apaches and the civilians under control because the civilians had went off and, mm -hmm. and, and done that Fort Grant massacre. And um, so he put Crook in place. And Crook is the one that used Apache scouts against Apaches. Because listen, they didn't like each other any Neither. more than they liked us. And they, were, they considered it prideful to be paid to go after another it tribe. Doesn't... You couldn't get them to go after their own tribe or a band of their own tribe, but they would... The, they'd come after they, my band. They'd come after your band, <laughs> and, and they done a fantastic job. I mean, they tracked, they tracked the, the uh, perpetrators down. It has been made abundantly clear that other equally valid interpretations on the questions concerning the demise of the early Indian tribes here in Arizona who was here and who wasn't, we've cleared up some of that. We've, we've thrown some other irons in the fire here. <laughs> he said, so it, as far as I'm concerned, it turns out maybe they didn't disappear at all. M maybe they've been here all the whole time. Or maybe, just maybe, another mystery of the superstition <laughs> thank you for watching this episode of mysteries of the superstition mountains 